Many of the use cases that an enterprise architect undergoes are mainly focused on servicing either internal or external customers. But the fact is, the same process can be applied to better manage enterprise architecture itself. So in this example, we're going to be walking through how you can look, think about enterprise architecture management in the scope of RDoC. We're going to use a, a little variation on some of our other best practices around modeling people and skill sets in the form of capabilities, looking at the people, the departments, the initiatives that are ongoing within those departments or people, as well as things like decision records and capability modeling. The reason for doing this is part of EAM is to be able to actually capture the decisions that have been made to give context for both historical purposes as well as governance. Let's take a look first from a more of a chief EA overview type, type of situation where we're looking at dashboards to understand how is our coverage. So when we think about enterprise architecture planning, we need to know what coverage we have across our technical domains and whether that meets our threshold of coverage that we desire. Not every um, technical capability is going to be created equal. So you want to be able to drill down into that and see how is that coverage happening. Basically to do this, what we've done is map the people to the skill sets or, or the technical capabilities they're an expert within. And you'll see that in just a moment. We also can use this aggregated overview to look at things like what projects are undergoing, what are they impacting, when do we have ADRs uh, coming up or, or architectural review boards coming up, um, and on what projects are those, are those going to be applied to. One of the biggest challenges though in enterprise architecture is bringing visibility into what the team can do and what uh, services they can provide. So the first aspect is, can I quickly find as a non-technical user an overview of who is even in enterprise architecture and what does this group enterprise architecture team actually do in the organization and how do they, who do they report to? So in Discover, we have this lightweight interface in order to actually give the users the ability to quickly search and find this kind of information. Here they've searched for group enterprise architecture. Maybe they heard about it in a meeting or a kickoff and they want to know more about it. They quickly get an overview of how it places in the org chart. They can see it reports to group IT. Um, but they can also use a simple one-click navigation in order to get more information about the EA group. So for example, let's look at what skill sets does this team have. Now you can extend this far beyond enterprise architecture, but within the scape of inter enterprise architecture management, mapping out your architects to the technical capabilities that they have expertise in will give you that kind of shopping list of who do I need to talk to on an individual topic. The nice thing here is people can enter this in many different ways. So if they're exploring from an idea of what is a group EA do, or if they're coming in and saying, hey, I'm working on an identity management project, who do we have I can leverage? Simply searching for identity management or click, double clicking down into it, you can see that we have three different experts in three different regions, all um, across many different teams as well. So even in the CISO office and the EA office. This can then be utilized to kick off those more collaborative uh, co-development type situations. Another way of thinking about this is understanding what services do your team provide. So a simple viewpoint highlighting the EA services provided can give external non-EAs clarity into what they can get from you. So maybe you need support in architecture assurance, for example. Double clicking into that, we can see not only what does this entail, we can also see the process behind it. So if I need to make a request, what's going to happen to my request? How do we move forward? And what different uh, phases are there within that? This documentation, again, is just bringing clarity into how we work together and how we can, can collaborate. You can also see that we've actually embedded a service request. So the great thing about the configurability of RDoC is you have the ability to request uh, services in the same way you would have the ability to request information. So on the services request, we can simply have a simple survey. We can say what the request is about. It's about you know building out a chatbot, for example, and that'll then create a broadcast workflow in order to notify the appropriate people. Coming back into the core EA's overview, once those things are all understood, we can actually use that same information that we used for what initiatives are they working on, what capabilities do they have, to start thinking about coverage on an initiative perspective as well. So the great thing about this is we can start to derive where are our EA spending the most time? Are they spending time on strategically aligned objectives or are they simply keeping the lights on? Another aspect of enterprise architecture management is being able to build out reference architectures that can be reused and consumable by others. So, a lot of people think about RDoC and, and being data-driven in the sense that it has to be from real structured data to begin with. But you can use 
data in order to articulate what a reference architecture is as well. So you document that in a freeform way in RDoc, and that becomes a reference, a reference model. You can then branch that reference model into a scenario in order to make a change, and then have a good governance process to approve the new change to the reference model. So in this example, you can see that there was an existing mainline reference model for around um, the logical architecture in, in Ping Federate, around authentication. You can see that somebody has decided to make a change to that where they introduce an API gateway, and we can decide whether or not that is an improved change to the reference model. And you can see the diff in that as well. The great thing as well is once decisions are made, so for example, if you make a decision about an, an initiative on this chatbot uh, project, you can capture that in an ADR repository. That repository of decisions allows you the context to say, okay, why did we end up with this solution? And why did we make these compromises? Often there's a good reason, but that's lost in history. An ADR can help capture that kind of information. The same can be able for once we have the reference architecture approved. So we talked about you know, designing that architecture, but then merging it back into the mainline once approved, then is populated both in RDoc as well as in RDoc Discover so that you can have that lightweight experience to find those reference, ar reference architectures. And with that, we wrap up some basic ways RDoc can help assist you in enterprise architecture management.